Here are nine things that every SP should know about masking. Now, when we talk about masking, I think most people have a general idea of what it is, but from a more technical perspective. What exactly is masking? Let's answer that question. It is, or it can be defined as concealing one's emotion by presenting another emotion. Okay, think of an actor on the stage or on the screen. They're effectively masking, but it goes a little bit deeper than just pretending. Colloquially, we understand masking as being changing your personality, not just your emotions, but your personality presentation for the purpose of gaining social acceptance. When first studied, researchers wondered why people acted disgusted, but then they would not act disgusted when they really were disgusted. Okay, think for example of um, you're a guest at, uh, at a friend's home, maybe a relative, and they serve dinner, and there's something you're expected to eat, and it tastes disgusting. <laughs> maybe you have been there, but you pretend that you're not disgusted because you're being polite. Well, I guess in a sense that would be a type of masking as originally they began to study it. Then they expanded their study to all facial expressions. Why do we, and, and humans communicate not only verbally but through facial communication, facial expressions. And so they wondered why is it that so often uh, humans will make faces, facial expressions, they communicate something different than what they are truly, really feeling. So you may smile, act happy when you're sad, or vice versa, whatever. Why do we do that? So that was the original idea behind masking. So that makes sense because it has to do with the face. It's like a mask that you put over your face. But now it's understood to mean that basically anything that has anything to do with your personality. And specifically, we'll dig into this a little bit more, but to gain the social acceptance. Number two, what are some examples of masking? I've got a few listed here. Number one is hiding stimming. You know what stim uh, stimming is, that's self-stimulation. Number two, pretending to ignore sensory discomfort. I know that I am bothered particularly by lights and by noise. I don't like to be in a crowd. I don't know about you, but I don't like to be in a crowd when everybody is talking at once. Just people having a conversation, but that drives me crazy. It doesn't seem to bother anyone else. Number three, minimizing personal interest. Even though you may have an interest in that, you're going to not talk about it because you know that annoys people when you just ramble on and on about something. Mimicking gestures or facial expressions. I get a problem with that, and many SPs do, because we have what is called a flat expression, or other people might call it a poker face. And so we have to intentionally express ourselves visually through facial expressions. I still don't do it very much, so I don't. that's not a problem for me. I'm not sure it's even a problem if you do it. But it's something that uh, I don't do much. Maybe you do. You can let me know in the comments. How do you mask? And, you know, some of the things that are more typical for you. Um, making eye contact or faking, we should say, eye contact. I don't like to look people in the eye, but uh, I've learned to do it because it's courteous. And sometimes I won't look them in the eye. Sometimes I'll look them in the forehead. Uh, naturally, Aspies tend to look people in the mouth because that's what's moving. That's where the noise is coming from. That's where the communication is. Uh, that's the source of the communication, primary source. Will the eyes also communicate, but primarily it's the words that they say. Now, some people say that the eyes are windows of the soul. Uh, I beg to differ. If you want to believe that, who cares? But, you know, from the abundance of a heart, the mouth speaketh, and you judge a person based on their actions, not on their, not on their, um, well, not on their outward expression. So that's got nothing to do with anything, but my opinion is windows are not, or your eyes rather are not windows to the soul, but the words that you say and your actions are the windows to your soul. 
So if your actions don't seem to be and your behavior doesn't seem to be and if your personality doesn't seem to be in sync with everyone else, well, we'll try to mask what we're doing and try to be in sync with everyone else. Number three is this. Well, why do we do this? Um, it seems that we are hardwired to uh, mask areas of our brain that are called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex regulate our emotional responses, our self-control. Uh, some people call this executive function. All right. There is this guy, I'm trying to think, of, oh, it's Phineas Gage. I've got it in the notes here. Phineas Gage, uh, back in the 19th century, was working on a railroad. Well, I guess he was a supervisor, manager, whatever, and there was an explosion, a controlled explosion. Well, obviously it wasn't very controlled, but it was supposed to be a controlled explosion. And it sent a spike through his head. Now, he survived, but... Besides the physical, biological changes that were obvious, what about his personality changes caused by the spike going through his head? Uh, that was very obvious because this otherwise uh, centered, mild-mannered man became uh, obnoxious from, from reports. And that, 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 that uh, was the catalyst, the seminal event that started the study of human behavior and what parts of the brain are related to certain behaviors. And because that spike went through what we call the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, the assumption was made that there's something in that section of our brain, that part of our brain that uh, controls our behavior. So maybe, just maybe, and, and I don't know this, but uh, maybe the reason Aspies in particular. Mask is because that area of our brain is not quite the same as the neurotypical people. So we just ask that question. We don't make a statement, but uh, is it possible that it's different? Is it conceivably possible? And obviously there is something different. And I'm guessing that's, that's where it is. Number four, does masking hide our disabilities? That's actually a bit of a trick question. Do you believe that Asperger's syndrome is a disability? Well, if you are unable to do something because of Asperger's syndrome, because you're an Aspie, then I would say, yeah, it's a disability. If you're unable, it's you're disabled if you're unable to do something. But using that definition comes with a um, comes with a problem because every human being alive is unable to do something. In fact, we're unable to do many things. I am unable to run um, 50 miles an hour. So I guess you could say I'm disabled. But usually when we think of disability, we think not in those terms, but we think in terms of somebody who once had the ability and then lost it. So now they are dis disabled. Well, in that definition, then no, we're not disabled because we never had the ability in the first place. But then again, as somebody who is born uh, quadriplegic would be considered Disabled. They never did have it. So how do you define disabled? But generally speaking, I would say, my opinion, you can have a different opinion, that's fine. But I would say that Asperger's syndrome, autism, uh, that part of the autism spectrum is not a disability. In fact, a lot of times it is an ability, but it depends on how you define disability. Number five is this. Who masks? The answer is... Everybody, everybody, everybody. Have you ever gone to a um, formal dinner and you notice the people are eating their fried chicken with their silverware? <laughs> uh, why do they do that? Well, to be socially accepted. That's not their normal behavior, I guarantee you. Uh, okay, there may be some people. I know folks in, in Europe prefer to use uh, tableware, silverware, 
instead of their fingers. They eat all kinds of things with their silverware. They eat a banana with their silverware, some of them. But uh, in the USA, we tend to eat particularly fried chicken and pizza. That is finger food. We eat it with our fingers. But if you're in a proper environment, I don't eat pizza with my fingers. I use a knife and fork because I think it's messy. But in a proper environment, we will change our behavior, our natural behavior. So in a sense, that's kind of masking. So who masks? Well, I think everyone does. But I also believe from observation and from what I've read and studied that, that Aspies, may be more prone to masking. So, everybody masks at a formal dinner, or almost everybody does. They don't dress the way they normally do. They don't behave the way they normally do. They're masking. They're, they're, it's a put on. And it's proper. And it's socially acceptable. And that's why they do it, is to be socially accepted. To be accepted by their peers, everyone around them. So, yeah, who mask? Everyone does, but it's more pronounced. It seems to be far more pronounced in people with Asperger's syndrome than neurotypical people. What dictates your mask? Answer, environment dictates your mask. Social expectations within the environment, like the formal dinner, dictates uh, social accept. Uh, uh, exceptions, there should be uh, expectations, not exceptions, dictate what mask we wear. Now, what if, and most people just naturally know what mask to put on, how to behave. The problem with people with Asperger's syndrome, we don't know. <laughs> we just don't know. It, I don't know why. Maybe it's that part of our brain that uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, is disabled. Don't know. So we have to learn what mask we are to put on. And when there are literally, well, basically an infinite number of masks, that is a very daunting task. But for example, you go to school, you don't wear a swimsuit. Unless you're going to swimming school, obviously, then it may be okay. So there's such a thing as wearing appropriate clothing. Now, I'm old enough to remember, and some of you watching are, when uh, it was appropriate to wear, to dress up. Uh, I was going to call it church clothes, but they don't even wear church clothes to church anymore. But it was appropriate to dress up when you flew on an airplane. And somebody somewhere at some point said, you know, this is real. We're sitting in this airplane for hours on end. It's really uncomfortable. So that went out the window. Uh, when I was growing up, men wore suits and hats when they went to church. And women dressed up when they went to church. I'm actually old enough when uh, women wore these, um, like a net over their face. You know, what, is, what, what was that? I don't know. But uh, I guess it made them look pretty, you know, mystique or something. Uh, I thought it was kind of odd. And women back then used to wear stoles. You remember stoles? A dead animal around your neck. When I was a kid, I thought that was so strange. What? And that's dressy. I mean, that's high class. But the point being, what dictates our mask is our social environment. And there was a time when going to church, you dressed up. Go to a funeral, you dressed up. Last time I went to a funeral, I was the only person there with a suit. I guess I hadn't learned yet. Wearing a suit. Uh, even the person who was deceased was not wearing a suit, which is, uh, you know, society changes. Our norms change. So what needs to be or I should say the expectations of a particular mask today may be totally different uh, in another generation as social norms migrate. I don't want to say they evolve because that implies they're getting better, but uh, they just sometimes they devolve, they go backwards. So things change. But the answer again is our environment expectations dictate what mask we put on. And if you don't know what mask you put on, um, it's, it's very difficult. That's why Aspies have a hard time. One of the reasons Aspies have a hard time keeping employment. Because they get a job, they can do the job very well, do the job, they have a good attitude, they're loyal to the company, to the, uh, they, they follow instructions, whatever, but they don't fit in. Because everyone else has on their work mask, their work clothes, their work face, their work behavior, their work personality. 
and the uh, person with Asperger's syndrome doesn't get it. Uh, they may be withdrawn, very quiet, timid, inhibited, almost fearful, or they may be the opposite. Overly assertive, just won't shut up, drive people crazy. But they wind up losing their job, not because they can't do the job, but because the people they work with don't like them. That's a fact. That happens all the time. Aspies are known for having a difficult time keeping jobs for which they are eminently qualified. Very frustrating. Uh, speaking of environment, um, uh, the other day I was watching a Pentecostal church service on YouTube, and uh, their behavior was very normal for a Pentecostal church service. Now, it probably would not go over in a liturgical church or the typical Catholic church. And as I was watching, I was thinking, why is it okay, socially accepted, for those people to behave the way they were behaving, which it is okay. I mean, if you want to do that, if it's uh, acceptable, they would uh, speak in tongues. They would jump up and down. There was one guy, literally, not joking, literally was running around the inside of a church. One guy got so excited, you may have seen this video on YouTube, he actually jumped in the baptistry. Uh, that's socially accepted in that place at that time. Now you take these same people who are in that church service, take them to Walmart. They don't speak in tongues, they don't jump up and down, they don't run around the inside of Walmart. Well, maybe they do, or I've never seen it. But uh, Walmart seems to have its own culture of behavior, its own dress code, which is basically wear something, and that's the dress code. That's all that matters. Why the difference? I mean, they're the same people. You just put them in a different environment, different location, and their behavior changes to fit the environment, to do what is socially acceptable. Now, that is, in a sense, mask. Masking is changing your behavior, as I understand it, changing your behavior to be socially accepted, because if you don't, it will be detrimental to you. Why do we avoid masking number seven? Masking can be uncomfortable for Aspies, and it can be even exhausting. Now, most people can mask, and they're fine with it. Put me in a Pentecostal church, you will not see me jumping up and down. I'm not going to jump over the pews. I'm not going to run around the inside of the church. I'm not going to speak in tongues. I'm not going to do any of those things. And it doesn't have to be a Pentecostal church, just any church. I'm just going to stand there or sit there. Uh, same thing with a ball game. You're not going to see me jumping up and down and cheering and carrying on like most people do because it, it wears me out. Probably the same with you if you have Asperger's syndrome. Now, the other element is not only is it exhausting, but it makes us feel hypocritical. It makes us feel like we're faking it. And we are faking it. But that bothers us. I guess most people don't mind faking it because everybody else is faking it, and faking it is acceptable. I don't want to fake it. I just want to be me, you know? Wherever I go, whatever I do, I want to eat my chicken with my fingers. Can't do that, and I want to eat my pizza with a knife and fork. I don't care what everyone else is doing. I don't want that gunk all over my fingers. It makes me uncomfortable. So why do we avoid masking? Because it makes us feel uncomfortable, exhausted, and makes us feel like hypocrites. Number eight, is it okay to mask? Well, again, that is uh, contingent upon circumstances, but... I would say, to a degree, you not only not only is it okay to mask, I mean, everybody does it, but sometimes it's even beneficial, and we are encouraged to mask, sometimes not. And I'll give you an example. Let's say, speaking of Walmart, let's say we're in Walmart, and somebody, a perfect stranger, says something, hi, how you doing, whatever. And we don't want to look at them. We don't want to respond. You know, it's 3 a.m. in the morning. And that's why we're at Walmart at that time of day, because we don't want to have to encounter people. But just being polite, 
We'll put on our friendly mask and say hello back. And may even look, may even look them in the eye. Perfectly okay. It's in, you're encouraged, at least I would encourage you to do that. Some may not. Um, okay, talk about church. You're in church, some guy, and if it's the first time you've ever been to a church, you know, they walk up, shake your hand, ask your name, ask you how old you are, ask you for your social security number, ask you what you do for a living, uh, ask you what you think of the weather. They're trying to be friendly, have a conversation, and they just drill you. I wish they wouldn't do that. Jeez. One of the reasons I don't like to go to church is they just wear you out with these questions. I hate to be rude, but it's none of your business what I do for a living or what I did for a living. Uh, but I would never tell them that, even though I'm thinking it. So I guess, okay, that's kind of a form of masking. So when people ask me, you know, what do you do for a living or what did you do for a living? Usually my response is, well, you know, uh, when I was little, I wanted to grow up to be a cowboy. But mama wouldn't let me. So is it okay to mask? I would say sometimes it is, sometimes it, it isn't. And again, there's that social thing. But the problem with many Aspies is we are accused of being um, aloof, being unfriendly. And I think we can change some of that. It's not going to kill us to say hi to people when you pass them. It's not going to kill us to look somebody in the eye, at least for a second, so we don't come across as aloof. I would encourage Aspies at least a little bit to get outside your shell. For no other reason, just to be friendly. So is it okay to mask? Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Now, another problem uh, Aspies have when we mask is, is this too obvious that we're masking? And people find that as uncomfortable as if we weren't masking. And so it solves absolutely nothing. So it's contingent upon your circumstances. And then number nine is this. Did you know there is a beverage you can drink that will remove your mask? <laughs> uh, and that is an alcoholic beverage. Totally wipes away your, maybe not totally, but wipes clean your inhibitions. The mask is gone. Now, I can tell you I'm uh, pushing 70 years old. And throughout my entire life, I have never tasted a drop of alcohol. I have no idea what it is. Well, I should say alcoholic beverage. I've had cold medicine, but uh, alcoholic beverage, never tasted it, and I plan to go to my grave unless they, unless they incinerate my body and turn me to ashes wherever I go. Uh, I plan to go having never tasted an alcoholic beverage. But the reason we even bother to bring that up is it's kind of like uh, Phineas Gage when he had that steel rod, metal rod, go through his head. Alcohol is kind of like a temporary metal rod, and it has much the same effect. It takes away all those inhibitions. Now, my observation is that when that happens, it exposes your core personality. I know people, if they get intoxicated, they become depressed and weepy, and they sometimes break down and cry. Because I guess that's their core personality. And there are other people, when they are intoxicated, have too much to drink, they become angry. They become enraged. Now, what enrages me and makes me break down and cry at the same time is when people don't click the like button. Click that thumbs up button. And then, uh, because if you don't, I'm going to be a drunk. So you got to do that. Now, don't forget that there's absolutely, positively, nothing wrong with you. The fact that you have Asperger's Syndrome is not a flaw. You're perfectly okay. You are normal for you. That's the way you came out. Well, that's the way you were before you came out of the womb. This is you. This is who you are. Don't be ashamed of who you are. Embrace yourself. This is not arrogance. This is not pride. This is simple, healthy self-acceptance. Be grateful for who you are. Don't have to flaunt it, but be grateful that you are the person that nature has made you to be. 
Number one is kind of obvious. Now, what we're talking about are the things that you should consider doing before you get a diagnosis for autism or for Asperger's syndrome, which, as you know, is level one of autism, high-functioning autism, otherwise known as Asperger's syndrome. My name is Ken. I'm pushing 70 years old. I've been there. I've done that my whole life. I've been an Aspie. So whatever state of life you are in right now, chances are I've already been there. So I'm speaking from a perspective of experience. So I just want to share with you what, uh, what I have learned, but that is not to say that you should not seek counseling and advice from a qualified therapist. So today we're going to talk about some of the things. Well, we've got a list here. I think I've got, what, seven things that you need to consider doing before you go in for your diagnosis with a licensed, certified, qualified therapist. Number one, you're probably already doing this because you're watching this video. And that is familiarize yourself with autism, Asperger's in particular. The reason we say that is so that you can learn about it and compare yourself. And say it one more time. The fact that you're watching this video tells me that you're probably already doing this. But for me, in my experience, this was very valuable. Because growing up as a young person, I had no idea what Asperger's syndrome was. I had no idea what autism was. Never even heard of it. But even later in life, uh, I had no idea. I mean, I've heard of Asperger's syndrome, I've heard of Aspies, I've heard of autism, was not that familiar with it. But then I came across somebody on Facebook, friend, who had been diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome. And I asked myself, um, what is that? <laughs> so I did some research. And as I was researching, I understood very clearly that uh, they were describing me. It's kind of like somebody had been following me around all my life and picked up on these things. By the way, I did a video on the 16 traits of Asperger's syndrome. Then we throw in a few uh, bonus things. So you want to watch that video and familiarize yourself with it as soon as this video is, uh, as soon as this video is concluded. So familiarize yourself with what it is. Compare yourself with the uh, traits that uh, those who have studied autism, have studied Asperger's syndrome, have, uh, have put together for us and see, you know, do you think that you are a fit, that you are a fit on the Asperger's syndrome uh, and on the, the autism spectrum, but Asperger's in particular? Number two is this, and that is get to know the principal researchers. Get to know the people who are truly qualified that actually know about Asperger's syndrome, about autism, because there are a lot of people. There are a significant number of uh, lay people. Now, I'm not saying they don't know what they're talking about, because some of them do. But then again, some of them are not as qualified as those who have actually done the research. These are the people that I want to hear from. These are the people, and there's nothing wrong with listening to the others because you want a broad spectrum of information from everybody. But these guys in particular, and I named two of them here, two in particular that you need to understand why they are drawing the conclusions that they have drawn and what those conclusions actually are. The first one is Simon Baron Cohen. He is British. He was recently knighted for his research efforts on this topic. I mean, you can't get any better than that, in my opinion. He has a lot of information available on YouTube. So if you don't like to read, uh, you can watch and you can listen. The other is Tony Atwood. He has a book called The Complete Guide to Asperger's Syndrome. That, I believe, is an absolute positive essential if you really want to know what Asperger's syndrome is all about. Now, I say this parenthetically because it comes to mind, but research is ongoing. So what they knew about Asperger's syndrome, say, five or ten years ago, well, they know more now. And five or ten years from now, they will probably know more. But you need to stay attuned to all of that by qualified professionals who are actually doing the research and one word of warning. You already know this, but I'm going to tell you anyhow. Our opinions and the opinions of researchers are biased by their personal opinions. 
Some of these people have religious or sociological or political opinions and views, and they can't help but to express those in their research. And I think everybody does that to some degree, so you can't get away from it. But what you can do is as you listen to researchers, whether they're people like uh, Simon Baron Cohen, Cohen rather, and Tony Atwood, or whether it's some guy on YouTube like me, we are all biased to some degree, and be careful to uh, keep that in mind so you can look around the bias. Number three is this, hang out with like-minded Aspies and like-minded empaths. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Uh, if you're an Aspie, you probably don't hang out with much of anybody. You're pretty much, pretty much a loner. And that's true. But, uh, hey, Facebook? Man, there are several groups on Facebook that focus on Asperger's Syndrome, on empaths, on people who are just quiet. You can find, uh, you can find some of those pages and just read what other people are saying, and their insights can be very helpful. There's just something that is very reassuring by knowing that others are right at this very moment facing the very thing that you're facing, enduring the things that you're enduring, the tough times you have at the job, the difficult times you have with your family, with people understanding you. There are many people, I mean a lot of them, who are going through the exact same thing. So you don't have to meet these people eye to eye and face to face if you don't want to. You can find them on the internet. And my favorite place to hang out with these people is on Facebook. And you don't even have to talk to them uh, uh, by, by leaving comments and messaging. You can just read what they have to say. Very, very helpful, at least to me, and I think it will be helpful to you. So do that before you go get a diagnosis so you can get a good feel of what the community is all about and what autism is all about and what Asperger's syndrome is all about. Number four is this. You may want to keep a written journal. Okay, I say written, maybe typewritten. I just uh, go to Notepad or maybe to Google Docs and I just write down my thoughts. Now, once you do that and you close out your program, you've typed whatever you're going to type or you've written whatever you're going to write in your notebook or on your device, whatever that is, then maybe a few days later, a couple weeks later, go back and read what you wrote. Now, what I like to do is this. I like to write my thoughts as if I am talking to another person. That is to say, as if I am me listening to someone else say what I have to say. So I can be a little more objective. Now, the reason I say that is sometimes I listen to people on YouTube and elsewhere, and they talk about their difficulties with maybe, maybe it's autism or maybe it's depression or some other disorder. And when I'm listening to them, I say, man, those people, uh, why do they think that way? Can't they see clearer than that? But then I stop and think, you know, uh, what they're saying is exactly what I think sometimes. So when I do it, and I'm not suggesting you have to do it this way, but just a, just a suggestion for an idea, is when you journal, imagine you are someone else giving you advice upon what you thought. That could, that could help tremendously, but do it however you find it is most convenient for you. So keep a journal. Number five, six, and seven. Now these are the most important three, I believe, uh, three things you really need to do before you find a, um, or even start looking for a therapist, or at least uh, number five and six, and that is avoid self-masking and self-demasking. Now, these are terms I just made up. There's probably official terms for these, but self-masking, by my definition, is when I'm trying to fool myself, not others, but fool myself, by um, masking, for example, okay, I've, I've studied autism, I've studied Asperger's syndrome. I know that there are certain traits that uh, are expected of people with Asperger's syndrome, and sometimes even subconsciously. I start imitating those traits. That is my understanding of self 
masking. That's not really me. That's uh, me kind of, and I don't even realize I'm doing it, but I'm kind of pretending that I have Asperger syndrome when I do that. And the other thing is just the opposite, what I call self-demasking. And that is you have traits of Asperger syndrome and you're conscious of it, so you don't do it. So one of the things I find myself doing a lot is rocking back and forth. And uh, I do this pretty much everywhere. But once I, once I get conscious of what I'm doing, I stop doing it. Now, the reason it's important to avoid self-masking and self-demasking is because when you go into a therapist, you want the therapist to see the real you. You don't want to pretend that you have autism, even subconsciously. You don't want to pretend you have Asperger's syndrome. By the same token, token rather, self-demasking. You don't want to pretend that you don't have it. You don't want to hide those traits either. So you don't want to display traits that you don't have or you don't want to repress traits that you do have. You want to be the real you. And sometimes you're not conscious of what you're doing. So we need to focus and be conscious when we do these things or don't do these things. Number six, I think this is real important. And that is research qualified therapist. There are a lot of people, a lot of therapists out there as you research for these people and they say that one of the things they specialize in is autism and one of the things they specialize in is Asperger syndrome. If that is one of the things they specialize in, I don't want to talk to them. I mean, I will if that's the only person available, but I don't want to talk to somebody where autism and Asperger syndrome is one of the things. I want to talk to somebody where it is the only thing they specialize in. Now, the reason for that should be kind of obvious. You want the very best of the very best for a lot of reasons, but the primary reason in my mind is because I know I do these things. I know I do self-masking. I know I do self-demasking. And I want somebody who basically lives with autism and Asperger syndrome. That is to say not live with it personally, but somebody who lives with people who have it, who are very attuned to what it's like. So if I inadvertently self-mask or I inadvertently self-demask, they will see right through it they will pick up on that. So I want people, I want a therapist who is keenly aware of what they're doing based on constant experience. Now, here's a good analogy that will help explain this. If you work in a bank, you're a teller in a bank, what you do all day uh, is you handle money. Now, maybe 20 years ago, you did this more so than today, but back then, and even today, people handle money all day day long. They're very familiar with its form, feel, what it looks like, what, it, what the texture is. And if somebody comes in with a counterfeit, with counterfeit currency, they pick up on it. I mean, it, it can be, well, it's akin to uh, self-masking. You know, it looks like a $10 bill to uh, anyone else. It feels like a $10 bill. And most anybody would not recognize it. But because the person who works at the bank works with cash all day long, they're far more sensitive to the real thing. And therefore, they are sensitive to the false thing. They are sensitive to self-masking. They are sensitive to self-demasking. And they know what autism spectrum syndrome really looks like. So that's the guy I want to talk to. So one more time, number six, and again, I think this is the most important one on the entire list, and that is research qualified therapist. Number seven is this, and this really isn't something you do after you get the diagnosis. This is the diagnosis itself. So get it. Get the diagnosis. Now, why would you do that? Uh, I don't know that anybody has to do it. It's not like uh, maybe in some extreme cases it's a matter of life or death. It could be a matter of health, but usually if you don't have a diagnosis, you probably do fine. But there are some advantages still of getting a diagnosis. And one of those is identity is essential for healthy self-esteem.
It's akin to, uh, have you ever gotten one of those DNA tests, 23andMe or one of those companies? And it's just very reassuring to know who you are, your self-identity. Very, very important. Don't let anybody tell you you are somebody else. Because other people love, you know this, other people love to stick labels on us. They call us names. Uh, usually they're not usually they're not nice names that they, they attach on other people. But sometimes they they're very complimentary names, they just don't fit. So we need to have a solid, sane, centered. Centered is important centered sense of self-identity to know who we are and that that test that the, um, the diagnostic test the therapist that the therapist gives you will help you get that centeredness so you will know who you are and if you don't qualify to be on the spectrum it's nice to know that Chances are, if you've gone this far, at least in my experience, there are exceptions, but chances are, if you have this much interest in uh, Asperger's syndrome or autism, chances are you are well within the spectrum somewhere. Not necessarily, so that's why you go see a therapist. But number, the second thing under number seven, why you want to get an official diagnosis is so you can explain yourself to others. So they will know, why are you doing what you're doing? Are you being lazy? Are you hypersensitive? Are you being aloof and rude? Why do you do these things? Why is it that you don't like to hang out in a crowded restaurant? Uh, why is it that you sit in the back row in church? Uh, why is it that you may have had a tough time in school or maybe excelled in school? Is it because you really, really studied hard or is it because you were lazy? and you didn't excel, or maybe there's some other reason, some um, neurological reason. Well, this helps explain that. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And above everything else, the most, ex the, the most important thing th that you can do is accept yourself as you are. The most important thing you can do is accept yourself as you are. Be centered. You know, don't think better of yourself, more highly of yourself than you are, but certainly don't think any lower. Just accept yourself exactly as you are. Yeah, I know. I know. You may not be the most beautiful woman on the planet. You may not be the world's greatest bodybuilder on the planet, but I'm guessing you're probably not the ugliest woman. You're probably not the skinniest, scrawniest guy on the planet. And uh, if you are, Contact uh, Guinness Book of World Records. Maybe they'll pay you something. I don't know how that works. But chances are, you're just a normal person. So accept yourself exactly who you are. Look in the mirror. Say, hey, I'm okay with that. And I'm perfectly okay with it. If you have Asperger's Syndrome, sometimes it just seems like that you are a mouse living in a world full of cats. You're trying to fit in, you're doing everything you can not to be mauled by other people. You're finding it very difficult to keep up this uh, mask in which you uh, are expected to look people in the eye. You're expected to be friendly and to have casual conversation with just complete strangers. And then uh, there comes the hug. There are people out there who want to hug you and quite frankly, you would prefer not to be touched let alone hugged. So what do you do? Well, you get tired after a while. It, you become fatigued. And so we call this Asperger's fatigue. It's something that uh, anybody and everybody with Asperger's syndrome will likely face multiple times throughout their life. And speaking of which, I'm pushing 70 years old. And so I've seen a lot of things in my time, and I just want to take some of those experiences that I've had as a individual who's had Asperger's syndrome as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult, as a middle-aged adult, and now as a um, senior. I know what you're going through, or at least I've gone through that stage of life, and I want to help you out with some of the experiences that I've had. So you're encountering this uh, phenomenon called Asperger's fatigue and you're just tired of it and you don't necessarily know where to turn and that can be 
frustrating, but more seriously, it can be even depressing. But, yeah, we got hope. There are things that we can do. There are strategies that we can employ to help us get through the rough times. And, by the way, they are rough times, but that doesn't mean they're permanent. We're not going to diminish the fact that they're difficult, but, hey, they don't have to stay that way all the time. Well, number one, we need to understand that everyone gets fatigued. I mean, everyone, everyone, and everyone. Now, let's stop and think of it this way. Here's a good analogy. Have you ever heard a song that you just love? Maybe a, a top hit song. Um, I'm trying to think of my favorite song of all time. Well, when I'm thinking of that, what song did you like the best? If you went back all your life, the song that you heard and you just fell in love with it, and you heard it over, you played it over and over and over again, what was that song? Who was the group? Put it in the comment section so everybody can know. We'll see if we agree with you. But you know, the point is this, uh, particularly when I, well, still, not just when I was younger, but still, I always had a fascination for the Beach Boys because I love that good harmony music. And I would hear a song that they sang and uh, play it because, you know, it triggered the dopamine response gave me a good feeling, and then I'd play it again, and then I'd play it again, and you know where I'm going with this. You play it over and over and over and over, and eventually you're tired of hearing it. That's fatigue, and that's what happens with Asperger's syndrome, but it's not just people with Asperger's syndrome that, that get fatigued. Obviously, anybody can, but the point is that sometimes you just have to stop playing the record. Well, can you do that as an Aspie? I mean, you're expected to make eye contact. Can you just stop making eye contact? I mean, is that even conceivably possible? And the answer is, yes, it is. We're going to tell you how to go about that in just a minute. Um, Southern gospel music. Well, I, the, this is a little bit off topic, but uh, I've always enjoyed listening to Southern gospel music. Now, when I was a kid, people thought I was a little strange because I had Asperger's syndrome. And what made it, even worse, well, I should say what compounded it, I don't know that it made it worse, but what compounded that impression was, I like Southern gospel music as a teenager. Everybody else was listening to, I don't know how many people out there my age, but they were listening to the Rolling Stones. Are they still alive, by the way? I don't know. The Rolling Stones, the Beatles, uh, and I was listening to the Blackwood Brothers and the Statesman Quartet. And there was one that record I loved in particular. Now, most people would get fatigued earlier, but there's something about people with Asperger's syndrome is they like things orderly and they, they're, they're not as, um, uh, with exceptions, they're not as bothered by repetition, particularly if it's something that you enjoy. And I would take that Blackwood Brothers Quartet, and if you don't know who they are, you can Google it, uh, and I would play it over and over and over and over again. And I didn't get fatigued. But my family did, <laughs> and one day I came home and I was from school, and I was going to play my Blackwood Brothers Quartet record because that's one of the way, ways that I could unwind from all the pressures of being a person with Asperger's syndrome and having to deal with all that um, all day long in school. I couldn't find my record. It was missing, and so I went looking for it, and finally I found it. Uh, apparently, my sister had broken it. <laughs> she got tired of hearing the thing. Okay, so music. You get tired of hearing the same. Even even if you loved it initially, you get tired of hearing the same thing over and over. It, you become fatigued. Uh, trying to think of some other things that would fall along um, those lines, things that you just get tired of. Uh, you never get tired of eating, right? But you get tired of eating the same food, over and over and over again. You want to tell me in the comment section if you want. I don't care so much about this, but if there is a particular food that you really like, but you wouldn't want to have it for supper every day, or maybe you would. I don't know. I could eat pizza 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Of course, I'd die of a heart attack or whatever, but I could. I mean, I just don't seem to ever get tired of it. And I could eat fried chicken, but you get the point. Uh, fatigue is something that everybody faces all the time. You get tired of going to the same job. You may get tired of wearing the same clothes. I don't. You'll notice that I wear basically identical shirts every time I make a presentation. 
Uh, I don't get tired of it, but Asperger syndrome, maybe you don't get tired of your shirts, but you certainly get tired of making small talk. You certainly get tired of having to make eye contact. You get tired of trying to maneuver through a world of cats when you are, in fact, a mouse. You get tired of wearing the mask all the time. It becomes fatiguing, and you need to take a break. Another thing, another example just comes to mind. I'll mention this really quick because um, just, just to drive home the point. But early spring, one thing I love to do is get out and uh, mow the grass because it needs to be mowing. I like to get out and do that. And I will mow the grass seriously two, three times a week, maybe even more in the growing season. And uh, I enjoy it. I figure, hey, I need to take a walk. Well, why not walk around the yard pushing my lawnmower? If I'm going to get exercise, going to take time walking, I may as well put it to good use. And as a bonus, I actually get something done. My yard looks nice. So that is what fatigue is all about. Because come October, I don't want to mow the grass so much anymore. In fact, I don't want to mow it at all. What a few months ago was extremely uh, enjoyable, and now it's just fatigue. Okay, so here are some of the things we can do. Number one... As we've been talking about, is we just acknowledge that everybody has fatigue. Everybody experiences it, and it's not just things related to Asperger's syndrome. could be anything, like mowing the grass, or playing the same music. You get tired of it, or wearing the same clothes, or going to the same job. It becomes a, a drill, and that dopamine trigger that was initially there isn't there anymore. So now it's just drudgery. So the second thing is this. This is important. Just um, go with the flow. Now, by that, I mean, um, say you take a daily walk. Every day, I walk about two and a half miles. And there's probably something that you do every day, particularly if you have Asperger's syndrome, because we tend to do things uh, regularly. They call those routines. Now, let's just, using this analogy, let's imagine that I'm out taking my two and a half mile walk now, this has actually happened before, and I'll start to feel this uh, pain in my shins, maybe somewhere else in my leg, but typically in my shins. And what do you do when that happens? Well, here's what happens. You quit walking. When you're, at least my experience, when you're doing any kind of physical exercise, there comes a time when you're going to face some kind of injury. And when that happens... Usually, the best plan of action is to just stop it, stop whatever you're doing, and give it time to heal. And that may take several days, it may take several weeks, it could, in extreme cases, take months. But you got to go with the flow. What does that even mean, go with the flow? By that I mean you need to listen to your brain's advice. So when I'm walking and I get a shin splint, that is my brain advising me that something is wrong. You got a car, you got those little red lights that come on and tell you there's something wrong with your car. Uh, I got a car that has a little light that comes on if the tires are low or if the uh, oil is low. I think everyone has that. And if the water is low and if the gas fuel tank is low, you got to pay attention to those lights. Well, you don't have lights in your body, so you have something in place of lights. You have this thing called pain. And those are your lights to say, there's something wrong here. To tell you, hey, you're low on water. I mean, literally. You get thirsty. Taking a walk, literally, you get pain if you're having a shin splint. And so what happens is, or what you should do, in my opinion, is just wait until it heals. Okay, now, what is fatigue? Well, that's, that's uh, similar to pain in the sense that it is your brain signaling you to knock it off. And instead of a uh, shin splint, it is fatigue. You've been doing this too much. You need to give it a break. It's time for a refreshment, uh, for your body to refresh itself. You need to stop doing that thing that you're doing. Well, if that 
thing you're doing is forcing yourself to make eye contact or forcing yourself to enter into small talk conversations, which are very uncomfortable many times. Just take a break because your body is saying, hey, if it hurts, quit doing it. Let it heal. Again, that's your body saying you need to heal. When you get fatigued, I think that is your body saying you're overdoing it. And you need to, uh, well, you know, when you're working out and you get, you know, get that uh, muscle fatigue and your muscle is breaking down, well, you've got to take a break for it to build back. And usually, if you're doing it right, it builds back bigger and better. And I think maybe the same thing applies to the conditions that, uh, the traits rather, that uh, people with Asperger's syndrome experience all the time. Maybe if you take a break, you'll get better at it when you come off your break. All right, so that takes us to number three, and that is this. How much time should you take to heal? How long does it take? Well, the answer to that is surprisingly simple. It's not a week, two weeks, or a month, or a year, whatever. The, the answer is until the pain goes away. Now, with Asperger's syndrome, the pain of making eye contact or whatever that interpersonal thing is, uh, the, the pain of being in a crowd or being around uh, sensory uh, overload, that pain may never go away. But the fatigue that comes with trying to mask that pain, that I think is something that can go away if you just give it a break. So, uh, you know, it, it, it takes me an entire winter to get recharged so I can have fun mowing the grass. Okay, I'm a little weird, but I think it's fun to mow, the, I think it's fun to mow my grass. Probably not so much fun to mow other people's grass, but, uh, you know, I like to mow grass. But it takes an entire winter to recharge. But when spring comes, I'm good to go. I'm looking forward to it. Very possibly, it could take you months to get over your fatigue. But then again, it could take a few days or even less. I don't know. It depends on you. It depends on your circumstances. But still, you need to give it a break and take however much time you need. Then we say this, and I think this may be the most important part of our presentation. And I thought long and hard about this when I was putting these uh, notes together. And that is, take breaks before the fatigue. Don't wait till the pain comes before you take a break from walking, you know. Or if you're a weightlifter, which obviously I'm not. I mean, I lift weights, but I'm not a bodybuilder. But still, I have enough sense to know this, that you don't just lift weights 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Nearly every bodybuilder I know, with a few exceptions, they'll have a day of the week when they work on one part of their body, like their legs, or they'll have their arms, or they may work on their chest or their back another day. What are they doing those other days? They're taking a break. They're just not doing it. Because they know that if they work out constantly, it's actually not going to build up. And everybody knows this about lifting weights. It's about tear down and then rest while it builds up stronger. And then you tear down and then you rest till it builds back stronger. And when you have Asperger's syndrome, when you're on this spectrum, sometimes you need to understand. Well, not sometimes, all the time, in my opinion. You need to understand that uh, you need to take a break, not because it hurts, but you need to take a break so it doesn't start hurting. So it will heal before it goes too far. So take a break. Just, okay, it's bothersome, and we were using the idea of eye contact earlier so it's bothersome to make eye contact with everybody all the time well just don't do that and even though uh, you're not fatigued you know you're going to get fatigued so to save yourself from being fatigued you just uh, you know look at their forehead or 
instead of small talk, maybe you could just smile, or I like to give people a thumbs up or maybe wave at them so that they don't think I'm being aloof and rude and selfish. I'll try to acknowledge somehow, some way that uh, they're a person, they're a human being. But I don't have to engage in small talk all the time. I can give it occasional breaks. Here's another good analogy that uh, I think is uh, very applicable to what we're talking about. Have you ever been driving down the street or the road, maybe a country road, maybe a highway, and um, your car stops because you are out of fuel? Out of gas. It used to be gas. Now sometimes your battery, you know, electric cars, battery runs in. So uh, pull over to the stop, side of the road and you, know, you call AAA or call somebody. And they bring you gasoline and you get your car going. And you think to yourself, I should have refueled a little bit earlier. That's what we're talking about. You don't wait till your tank runs out of gas and then call AAA and get some fuel and go through all that. You replenish your gas tank constantly. Now, what's really annoying is if you run out of gas and you get your cell phone and you forgot to charge your cell phone. And there you are stuck. And that's the way we go through life sometimes. We wait till we're out of gas. We wait till our cell phone battery is dead. And then we say, oh, I need to get more gas. Oh, I need to recharge. What would happen if we just kept gas in the gas tank all the time? Well, the way to do that is got to take occasional breaks and actually pull your car into a gas station. That's taking a break. You have to take your cell phone or whatever device you're using and you got to plug it in. Got to take a minute or less to go through that physical action of plugging the thing in. I think you do. Maybe they have devices now where you don't even have to do that. I just don't keep up with that stuff. But I think you get the point is you don't wait till you get fatigued to deal with the fatigue. You deal with it now. Well, maybe today would be a good day. You don't feel fatigued today, but you know you're going to, so hey, Rather than wait until you have this emotional, mental fatigue, you're just not going to look everybody in the eye. You're not going to engage in small talk conversation. You're just going to be yourself. Granted, you can be polite and nice to people. It doesn't mean you have to be a total jerk. I think everybody knows that. But I hope everybody knows that. But, yeah, go ahead and take a break before the gas tank says empty, before the battery on your phone runs down completely, go ahead and make taking a break a part of your routine. With all of that said, uh, let's close out by saying this. And this is number five. Don't fight it. What exactly does that mean, don't fight it? Well, it means this. Fatigue is a natural process. Like we said before, go with the flow. But sometimes even then, we have this um, natural urge of resistance where we just want to fight it. You know, um, how else can I say this? You got to keep in mind that your brain, as we mentioned earlier, is sending you a signal. And it's saying... Your fatigue is pain, so you need to knock it off. But when you understand that this is a natural part, well, it's a natural part of nature. And if you go against it, you're going against the way that you are designed, the way nature has made you. Now, I want to imagine, we're going to use one more analogy and then we're done. But I want you to imagine... You're driving down the road, and there's a lake. And you think, um, boy, it'd be nice to go out on the lake, maybe do some fishing, so you drive your car out into the lake. And you don't get too far before you realize, oh, that was a mistake. Now, nobody, I don't think, anyone is dumb enough to actually do that. Of course we're not. But why would we be dumb enough not to recognize that 
just like a car, is not designed to be a boat, that our body is designed for certain specific things, and uh, we have to go with the flow of our design. And the flow of the uh, uh, the flow of the design of your car is drive it on the road. Now maybe you got one of these things that uh, all-terrain vehicle, so you can get off the road. Maybe you're really rich and you can buy one of these cars that uh, that works as a boat. I don't know. I never even seen one of those things. I know they exist, but the point is, you are designed to work a certain way. Okay, I know. I heard of one guy who could leap buildings at a single bound, and the people would shoot bullets at him, and they just bounce off. They called this guy Superman. Um, you're not Superman. I'm pretty sure. No, I could be wrong. There could be a guy named Clark Kent out there somewhere listening to this, but none of us are Superman, Superwoman. All of us at times need a break, and we shouldn't wait. You ready for this? We shouldn't wait until we break to take a break. Let's dig right into this. Now, let's begin by imagining, imagining rather a solar eclipse. That occurs when you are looking at the sun and the moon, well, it literally gets in between you and the sun. And so you can no longer see the sun because the moon is in the way. The sun and the moon and you, all three are in perfect alignment. So again, the sun is totally blocked. Now, with that thought in mind, here is the analogy. The sun represents reality. And the moon represents your thinking. So I call this a psychological or a mental eclipse. The objective, from your perspective, is to get your thinking in line with reality. Get the moon in line with the sun. So it's not that reality disappears. It's still there. Obviously, the sun didn't go away. But your thinking is in line with reality. And I find that one of the reasons that many people with Asperger's syndrome become depressed and frustrated is because they don't have a psychological, psychological eclipse. They don't have this mental eclipse. Their thinking is not in line with reality. Their moon is not in line with the sun. So we need to work towards discovering, first of all, what is really reality, and that's the hard part, because of confirmation bias. So the very first thing that we say causes depression in people with Asperger's is they miss the eclipse. Have you ever read in the paper, you know, there's going to be a solar eclipse, and you say, man, I want to see that, then you forget about it. Most people don't do that, but uh, yeah, I've done it a few times, you miss the eclipse. But in the, from, from our perspective, we caused the eclipse. So we, we miss it because we didn't do it. So we need to cause this eclipse. Don't miss it, but align your thinking with reality. By the way, that's not just an Asperger's thing, an Aspie's thing. That's a people thing. A lot of people don't have their thinking aligned with reality, and they go off in all kinds of directions. Now, I'm, I'm pushing my 70th birthday. I tell people that uh, I'm 68 years old, 68 and a half. And then I tell them that I would be 69, but uh, I was sick a year. Uh, whatever. All right, now, so I've learned a thing or two over these 70 years, nearly 70 years. Preschool, I had Asperger's syndrome because I believe it's innate. I believe it's inherited. I believe it's a biological, pathological. Early days in elementary school, then into what we used to call junior high, they now call it middle school. I went through all of that as a person with Asperger's syndrome again in high school, college, adulthood, and now in my senior years. The reason I say that is because I've seen a thing or two, and so I've learned a thing or two, and I want to share that with you. Now, I'm not saying that um, you should never talk to a therapist because, hey, therapists, uh, they're trained. 
Many of them are trained properly. Some of them not, but many of them are trained properly to help you through your journey. But there's something that many therapists are missing. And no, I'm not critical of therapists. Well, some I am, but in general, no. And that is many of them just don't have the experience. Uh, they're not, they're not, um, they're not Aspies. They don't have Asperger syndrome. So they, as they are counseling you and helping you, and many of them do help as they counsel, but they're still missing that experience component. They really can't put themselves in your shoes through uh, true empathy is something we're going to talk about in just a moment. And so sometimes you need somebody who's actually been there. And I don't know too many people on YouTube who are pushing 70 years old seniors who are talking about this. Maybe I, I may be the only one. I don't know. So number one is this. We miss the eclipse. Let me reiterate, because this is so important, we need to align our thinking with reality. And when we don't do that, we trigger often depression. We become frustrated. And so we've got to have this mindset that, uh, well, in nature, you know, we don't cause the eclipse, but as people, psychological eclipse, yeah, that's something that we can actually manipulate. So we don't have to miss it. We just need to find out what reality is. Again, hard thing to do sometimes and align our thinking with reality. And then we won't have those disappointments. Talk about that in just a second. Number two, because we miss the eclipse, we have what I call unaligned expectations. Now, our objectives as sane and centered humans is to align our expectations again with reality. Not just our thinking, but our expectations, our anticipations, what we think is going to happen, what we think should be happening in the present. So failure to do so inevitably leads to disappointment. Now let's stop and think about that word, disappointment. Two parts to it. First part is dis, and the second part is appointment. Have you ever missed an appointment? I missed a few. I recall one time I had a doctor's appointment, and this is back when I had my business, and I said, man, I need to get to the doctor. And... Um, so I left the office and I got in my car and I went home. I just, I don't know what I have. I just forgot and I missed my appointment and the doctor, uh, needless to say, was uh, disappointed. So I missed my appointment and the doctor was disappointed because he expected me to be there at a specific time and in his office, a specific place. All right, so the uh, prefix dis, D-I-S, that comes from a Latin word that roughly means apart. So we have these mental appointments, expectations, and we miss them because we get in our car and go home, because we go in a different direction. That is to say, maybe not physically, but our minds are going somewhere else. So we need to align our appointments so that they are not missed appointments and they are not dissed appointments. And the point of talking about appointments is so that we have anticipation, that we have expectations that are aligned with the sun, that our moon is aligned with the sun, that our, our uh, thinking, our expectations are aligned with reality, and this is what we can really expect to happen. And so if the doctor expected me to miss my appointment, he would not have been disappointed. He would say, well, that's Ken. You know, sometimes he comes, sometimes he doesn't show up. Uh, he would probably cut me out of his practice if I did that all the time. But as people with Asperger syndrome, we seem to have this difficulty anticipating and expecting things that uh, just do not fit reality. So what is reality? 
there are what? I think uh, 7.8 or 8 billion people on the planet right now. Did you know that every, we talk about people with Asperger's have specific traits. Well, every human being on the planet, all 8 billion of us have traits of one kind or another. Now, there is one trait that virtually every human has to one degree or another. And we're going to talk about that in a little more detail in just a second. But there is one trait that every human being seems to have. And that is the trait that uh, they don't care. I call this, lack of a better term, the uh, I don't give a rat's rump trait. They just don't care. So we have this expectation that people should care about us because we have, we have Asperger's syndrome. We are autistic. We are on the spectrum. Well, they're on the spectrum too. They're on the, I don't give a, rat, uh, a rat's rump spectrum. And if we don't recognize that, we are going to be disappointed. And our moon and sun are not going to align. We're going to have a, a not going to have a psychological alignment. We're not going to have a mental eclipse. So we need to understand, hey, people just don't care. Now, if you stop and think about it, how many people do you know? I mean, of the 8 billion people on the planet, how many of them do you actually know? Most people, I think, know somewhere around one or 200 individuals by name. You see them, you know who they are, you recognize them. The rest of them, uh, you know they're there because you see them on television. So, that, you know, you see them in a crowd. You go to the city, whatever, you see them. Um, football game, hey, man, look, there's thousands of them. But you don't know those people. You can't possibly conceivably care about every single one of those individuals. And by the same token, we can't expect all of those individuals to care about us. That is a false expectation. That is something that we need to learn that is not in alignment with reality. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't care. I'm not saying that we shouldn't expect people to care, but to expect people to care all the time, all people all the time, you know what? That's way out of line with reality. Number three is this. Okay, number one was we miss the eclipse. Number two is we miss or we have unaligned expectations. And number three is we make what I call should statements. People should be more considerate. Yeah, they should. But guess what? Reality is they're not. People should be more understanding. Yes, they should, but they're not. People should be more giving. Yes, they should, but they're not. So we make these should statements that are not in a line with reality. So just because people should do it doesn't mean we should anticipate it. Doesn't mean that we should expect it. And if we do anticipate and expect everyone to feel sorry for us or to be supportive because we have uh, Asperger's syndrome or we're on the spectrum, autism spectrum, we're going to be, what is the word again? Disappointed. We're not going to have that alignment. All right, number four is this. We tend to, and this is a big deal. You got to listen to this because it's so very important. We tend to use ourselves as standards for others. That is to say, we, uh, I will use myself as a standard for other people. So we need to admit the fact that if you have Asperger's syndrome, chances are you are an empath. It's important to point out that there are two distinct types of empathy. Both are empathy, but they're different types. One is cognitive empathy and the other is effective empathy. Now, some psychologists say there's more than just these two. But by and large, there are two types of empathy, cognitive and effective. People with Asperger's tend to be very strong in effective empathy, whereas they are very shallow in cognitive empathy. By that, I mean that if you have Asperger's syndrome, and you see somebody sitting alone, you kind of feel sorry for them because you know what that's like. You, uh, you have walked a mile, well, you've walked a lifetime in their shoes. 
And so you have empathy for that person. You have effective empathy for that person. But cognitive empathy is something that is very prevalent in psychopaths. And on this channel, we talk about both things. We talk about uh, autism, Asperger syndrome, and we talk a lot about psychopaths. Specifically, we talk about uh, individuals who are um, have this trait where they are very selfish and self-centered. We call that narcissism or a covert narcissism. Talk about both things on this channel because they are interrelated. They're intertwined. A lot of people don't recognize that and that's, uh, that's cognitive empathy. We don't recognize. So we, we are easily, as people with Asperger syndrome, we're easily fooled, uh, very easily fooled. We can be very naive. We'll believe anything. Again, we think the car salesman actually likes us. We think the waitress is really, really friendly and she must, she must be our friend. Then after we pay the bill, leave the tip, all of a sudden our friend is gone. She don't want to talk to us anymore. And we wonder what happens. We don't understand because we lack that cognitive empathy that, uh, no, nah, she wasn't really our friend. Now, a person who is a narcissist, they zoom in on that. They can pick up on that very, very easily. They immediately know that you are naive. They know that you're gullible. By the way, did you know the word gullible is not in the dictionary? Yeah, look it up. We have effective empathy. Okay, here's, here's a test. Now, you may have done this before, but imagine that you are driving down a country road, two-lane country road, and you see a turtle in the middle of the road. Now, the turtle is trying to cross the road. You see that. And so uh, you have empathy for that turtle, effective empathy. So you pull your car over if it's safe to do so. And I've done this several times. And you pick up the turtle and you put it at the side of the road so it doesn't get run over. Okay, I just thought of a joke. Are you ready? <laughs> why, why did the turtle cross the road? Because it's not a chicken. I didn't say it was a funny joke, I just said it was a joke. All right, but, but I've done that before. And when my grandkids were little, sometimes I'd take the turtle home and we would keep it for a day or two and then we'd take it back out in the wild. That is what we're talking about when we say effective empathy. We need to understand, as we are aligning reality, our moon with the sun, we need to understand that most humans do not possess our level of empathy. Most people do not possess your level as an empath, your level of effective empathy. But we expect them to because it's very natural to us and we expect other people to be like us, to think like us. But they don't. And when we have those anticipations, those expectations, again, we're disappointed. And that can trigger depression. What to do? Well, what to do is kind of simple. Just acknowledge the fact that most people don't have our level of empathy. They just don't. Don't expect it. Number five is this, excessive feelings of entitlement. Now, I, I got to hasten to say, I got to say this very emphatically, that I think all humans are entitled to a level of uh, compassion. Doesn't mean we're going to get it. Well, I think we're entitled to it. So when I say excessive feelings of entitlement, I'm not saying that we should have uh, no concern for other people whatsoever. Yeah, absolutely we should, but there's that should statement. It doesn't always happen the way we think. It should happen. Most people, for example, well, let me frame this as a question. Do you know what Williams syndrome is? Most people have no idea. Most people have no idea what uh, Asperger's syndrome is. I mean, for years. Uh, I've had it since before I was born. I didn't even know what it was. Didn't know I had it. But as I learned and educated myself, I discovered, hey, the traits of Asperger's syndrome, of autism, I see those so obvious in me. So after a lot of study, I finally went to a therapist 
And I said, I want to know, am I on the spectrum? And after a few counseling sessions, okay, she just kind of checked all the, all, the, uh, all the check marks. I mean, just boom, right down the line, you have Asperger's syndrome. You are definitely on the autism spectrum. So the reason I say that is just like we may not know what Williams syndrome is. Most people have no idea what uh, Asperger's syndrome is. So how can we expect to have that feeling of entitlement when most people don't even know what it is? They just think we're aloof or they think we're quiet or shy or we're space aliens. They, they don't know. So when we have these excessive feelings of entitlement, we're going to be disappointed, disappointed, and that's going to trigger depression. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't lobby for, well, lobby the government, lobby schools, whatever, so that people with autism will be uh, taken care of. Yeah, we should do that. But that excessive feeling that everywhere we go, people should just sense that we have autism. They should just sense that we have Asperger's syndrome. Disappointment, that's what's going to happen and trigger depression because not reality, your sun and moon are not in a line. Number six is we take too little self-responsibility. Okay, alignment, again, is most people don't even know that we have, they, they don't even know what Asperger's syndrome is, let alone that we have it. They don't understand why we behave or don't behave in a certain way. They have no idea. Because of that, it is so important that we learn to assume responsibility for ourselves. Well, how, you, how do you do that? Well, you evaluate your aptitude. What is it you can and cannot do? And then you operate within your aptitude. And if there's something you can't do, that's when you try to get help. Now, I can give you a couple good examples of this. Um, there's a reason why I did not go to medical school and become a brain surgeon. It's not because I don't like the uh, money those guys make, but um, I just don't have the aptitude. Now, I would really love to have been an NBA star, National Basketball Association. I'd love to have made a million dollars a month for a few years and then retire in a big mansion somewhere. Well, the problem with that is I don't have the aptitude to play basketball. And folks, look, when you live in Indiana, where it's a state law that every new home that is built has to have a basketball goal in the driveway. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but yeah, this is a basketball state. You know, it's bad enough to have Asperger's syndrome, but to have Asperger's syndrome and you can't play basketball and you live in Indiana, talk about trigger depression. Well, you know, you just acknowledge the fact, I don't have the aptitude. I just can't do it. You know, I can dribble basketball. I can run I just can't do both of them at the same time. So you are who you are. There's nothing wrong with you. Everybody, everybody is on a spectrum of some kind uh, or another. And when we compare ourselves with other people, we're making a huge mistake. So what you need to do, what I need to do, what we all need to do is compare ourselves with ourselves. Not with everybody else, because if you compare yourself with everybody else, one or two things are going to happen. You're either going to think you're better than everyone else, or you're going to think everyone else is better than you. And neither one of those are good positions to be in. Go sit in a, a um, shopping mall sometime. If you can find one that's still open. Sit in a shopping mall sometime and just watch people go by. And notice how many of them... I probably shouldn't say this, but um, notice how many of them are ugly. Okay, I said it. And here you are feeling, oh, I'm so ugly. Well, guess what? You're on the uh, ugly spectrum. And there's a lot of people uglier than you. 
Okay, there's a lot of people better looking than you. A lot of people more fit than we are. A lot of people out of shape, worse than we are. We're on the spectrum like everybody else. But this thing about comparing ourselves with other people and then feeling either superior or inferior, that's not aligning our thoughts with reality. So, one more time. Align your thoughts with reality. Get that psychological psychological alignment of your sun and the moon, your thinking with reality. Get your psychological eclipse in place. How do you know who is and who is not a true and reliable, a dependable friend? Or better said, a potential friend. How do, we, how do we tell the difference? People all around us, we don't know these people. Some of them are friendly, some of them are not friendly. How do you tell? You know, the problem with those of us with Asperger's syndrome is it seems that we just don't have that innate ability to tell the difference between people who are potentially good friends and potentially fake friends. And as a result of that, we become, uh, uh, we don't actually become friends. Well, we, we become friends to these individuals who are not friends with us, and it doesn't end well. Often it ends in disaster. So how do we how do we tell the difference? Well, here are four things that will help us avoid those fake friendships. I call it the fake friendship trap. I'm pushing 70 years old, and during my lifetime, I have learned a thing or two, and what I've learned, I want to share that with you. I've been through whatever you're going through, or that is to say, I've been through that stage of life, whether you're a young person, middle-aged, uh, older adult, wherever you happen to be, I've been there, and I've had Asperger's Syndrome since day one. I just want to share some of my experiences, some of the things that I have learned with you. Maybe it'll help you. All right, number one is this. It is not what it seems. Now, that, that should be obvious, right? And to neurotypical people, it usually is obvious. But things are not always the way it seems. Now, being people with Asperger's syndrome, we tend to categorize things and we make them, well, oversimplified. We like everything to be neat and orderly and in a row where we can depend on it with no surprises. We don't like busyness. We want it neat and orderly. Okay, in a neat and orderly world, people who are friendly are potential friends and people who are not friendly are not potential friends. How could it be any more simple? Well, it can't be and that's the problem. That's too simple. Fact of the matter is it's not always what it seems. Sometimes the people who are not friendly turn out to be our best friends. Sometimes the people who come across as friendly or present to use the term psychologists use, present as friendly, it's fake, it's put on. They're in intentionally trying to trick us. Now, I recall, as I'm sure many of you do, being in school. And I remember some of those mean teachers. These are not, the, these were not my friends, or that's the way I thought, but it turns out sometimes the meanest teachers were the best teachers. They had, uh, our best interest, that is the, the student's best interest in mind, and to get across the lesson, they understood they had to keep order in the classroom, and they did. And if we weren't happy about it, that was not an issue with them. Their issue was to get us quiet, to get us attentive so we could absorb what they were teaching. So to an Aspie, we would say that teacher, well, to most everybody would say that teacher was mean, not our friend. But ultimately, yeah, they were friends. Things are not always the way they seem. Number two is this. Nobody is perfect. Um, yeah, I've been around nearly 70 years. I have yet to meet the perfect person. I see this guy in the mirror every morning when I shave, and I see imperfections. Can't even look at myself without seeing imperfections. We are all imperfect. There's nearly 8 billion of us on the planet right now. We're all imperfect. So 
we need to understand that when we're trying to sort out who is and who is not a reliable friend, that we're not going to find that person who is perfect. There was a philosopher, his name is Arthur, Arthur Schopenhauer. He lived in the 19th century, and he pondered this idea of acquiring a true friend, and he came to the conclusion that, uh, well, the, the ideal friend is not there. No, obviously, I'm paraphrasing. First of all, he spoke German, but uh, that, that was his conclusion. There is no perfect friend. Now, on the spectrum of friendship, there are people who are much better friends, obviously, than others. There are some who are friends, some who are good friends. There are some who are enemies. There are some who are bad enemies. But everybody is on the spectrum, and there is no absolute perfect. So the reason I say that is, as we go through life and we're trying to find that one person that we can rely on, we need to be careful that we don't try to find out that perfect person because we will always be disappointed. We will always wind up being hurt uselessly without cause. And it's really, we are hurting ourselves because we had expected somebody to be perfect and they weren't and we were oh so disappointed. And uh, I can't begin to tell you how many times I have made that mistake in my life where I was too disappointed in somebody because I was too anticipatory in what I expected of them. So that's number two. No one is perfect. So it's good to know that no one is perfect. So what do we do with that? Well, it is impossible to sort through those who comprise our milieu, that is, our social surroundings, our social environment. But we can identify those who are likely to be reliable friends. We can identify those who are not likely to be good friends. And again, nobody is perfect, and we're not always going to get it perfect, but we can improve substantially, and that takes us to number three. Character trumps credentials. Now you have heard the parable of the Good Samaritan. The Samaritans were an ethnic group that lived in Palestine about 2,000 years ago. And they still live there. There's still a small community of Samaritans uh, in, in that area. The other people saw the Samaritans as bad people. We would say they were uncredentialed, they were unacceptable, because they were, um, they were half-breeds. And what's more, they had a religion that was not really acceptable to everyone else's religion. So they were flat out rejected as heretics. All right, so there was this Samaritan, and he was taking a journey, he was taking a trip as they did back in those days. They pretty much walked wherever they went. They would have maybe a caravan, a mule, or a camel, whatever. And as he was traveling, he came across another traveler who had been attacked, severely beaten, laying on the side of the road, I guess in a ditch or whatever, bloodied and bruised and maybe near death, and somebody had robbed him and taken all of his goods. And the Samaritan stopped to help him and took care of him. So uh, the question is, who is the good friend? The people who were credentialed, who religiously agreed with the guy who was wounded? The credentialed people who were, had ethnic identity with the person who was wounded? Or was it the person who helped the person who was wounded? And obviously the answer is the person who helped. That was the true friend. So uh, what is the lesson we learned from that? Well, what we learn from it is this. Observe how people treat others. Not how they treat you, but how they treat others. I mean, what do we call these people? Fair weather friends? When all is going well, they're right there for us. But when things are not going well, they're nowhere to be found. And things are going well. So how do you tell? You observe how people treat other people who are not in your situation or who are in a worse situation. So that is the lesson which is um, 
quite frankly, very profound if you stop and think about it, that if you see another individual who is very kind to you and friendly, so you say, well, he's friendly or she is friendly, therefore she is a potential friend, but that potential friend is not treating others well, maybe most people, but some people not so good, that's a red flag. That tells you that as this person abuses other people, this person, this candidate for friendship, will likely abuse you as well when circumstances present themselves to their advantage. Red flag, okay, that's a big red flag. So just because somebody is friendly to you, doesn't mean they're not a good friend, doesn't mean they are a good friend, basically it means nothing. But how they treat other people, that means everything. So when you're sorting out friends from non-friends, look for those good Samaritans because yes, they are out there. So number four is this. And this I think is very profound. And that is, uh, this is counterintuitive, so it's not gonna make sense at first, but a true friend is one who will hurt you to heal you. Now that last part, that last prepositional phrase to heal you, that is very important. But at first, first thought, okay, somebody is going to hurt me and they're a friend, are you? No, that, that, that doesn't seem right, but wait a minute. There is, there is a saying, blessed is the wounds, or blessed are the wounds of a friend. Somebody cuts me and slashes me, I don't think that's a friend until you stop and think, now wait a minute. I'm trying to think of the people in my life who actually, who physically, literally have cut and slashed me. And uh, I can think of uh, three. The first one was a heart surgeon. The second one was a brain surgeon. And the other, I forget what they call him, but I had a rotator cuff injury and he cut my shoulder. I forget what you call people who do that. Were those my friends? Well, the quotation again is, the saying again is, blessed are the wounds of a friend. Yes, they did cut me. Yes, it did hurt. Believe me, it hurt. You ever had heart surgery? Those weeks, days immediately following, one thing you absolutely do not want to do is cough. Uh, the pain is severe. When I had shoulder surgery, the pain in my hand was almost unbearable. Those people hurt me. Blessed are the wounds of a friend because they cut me because they were trying to help me. So when you are looking for a friend, don't look for somebody who will never hurt you, but look for somebody who will hurt you if their true, genuine goal is to help you. All right, so how do you tell who is a surgeon and who is a thug with a knife who just wants to slash so he can hurt you for the sheer joy of hurting you and take advantage of you? Well, here's a couple points. First of all, a true friend will apply emotional anesthesia. That is to say, he or she will try to minimize the pain as much as possible while the criminal will try to cause as much pain as possible. So every time I went into surgery, before, before, before they began to cut on me, they made sure the pain was minimized. They gave me anesthesia. Second, a true friend will cut no more than is absolutely necessary. That is to say, a true friend will say what you need to hear and they won't say any more. They won't, they won't belittle you. They won't uh, upbraid you. They will not do anything just to cause pain. Now they're going to cut on you. They're going to tell you what you need to hear. But um, the fake friend, he will slash you with words that are hurtful just because he likes to hurt. So there is this saying out there, it's called tough love. 
And sometimes the criminal will say, I'm slashing you because I love you. It's called tough love. No, they're just lying. It just makes them feel good about cutting you and try to make you feel good about letting them cut you. So we need to understand that a true friend will say no more, no less than what you absolutely need to hear. When I, got, when I had heart surgery, they cut exactly what needed to be cut and no more. When I had brain surgery, they, they literally cut a hole in my head. You may be able to see the indention that is uh, left here in my uh, temple. But they didn't cut things that didn't need to be cut just to be cutting them precisely and, yeah, with precision, with precision. They cut only what needs to be cut. And so a true friend will say words that are hurtful. But that's, that's it. That's how you can tell the difference. Number um, three is this. A true friend, like a good doctor, this is number three of number four, if that makes sense. A true friend, like a good doctor, will focus on restoring you to good health. That's the objective. Blessed are the wounds of a friend when the end objective is to restore you to good health. The wounds of an enemy, the objective is to take advantage of you. Some people just enjoy hurting people. That's their reward. They just like to cut and slash. Some people like to wound you so they can take further advantage of you. Psychopaths will do that, but um, anybody who is not a true friend and just enjoys taking things from others, we're thinking here, narcissist will do that. When looking for a friend you can trust, rather than seek out those who will never, ever, ever hurt you, but rather seek out those who will only hurt you when it is in their or your rather best interests so ob again observe how they treat those around them the way that uh, they treat others is the test of how they will ultimately treat you covert narcissists and this is so important are very proficient in faking friendships so uh, all of us you know i think have been fooled by them at least once. Most of us have been fooled by narcissists multiple times. But there are always, always telltale dangers. There are always danger signs. There are always red flags that we need to observe. So rather than focus on how they treat you, take notice of how they treat others with the understanding that uh, eventually that's that's how they're going to treat you in the future